Hey guys, it's Mrs. Olenichek, and we are going to talk about cell structures and function today. Um, make sure that you are taking notes and writing down any questions that you have so you can ask them in class. Um, feel free to pause me anytime you feel like it. And here we go. So when we start talking about cells, we have to do a little bit of history. So the first guy to use the term cell was named Robert Hooke, and he actually looked at these cork cells under the microscope, um, and these are actually just cell walls, but he thought they looked like the rooms that monks lived in, and those are called cells, so he called them cells, and we call all cells cells now because of it. Um, another guy who contributed quite a bit to cell theory was Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Um, he liked to look, to look at lots of different things under the microscope. Um, one of them was pond water, which we're going to check out in our lab. Um, and he called those things swimming around in it animalcules. Um, all of their observations, as well as many observations by many different scientists, contribute to what we call the cell theory. So the cell theory is that all living things are made up of cells. So if you're alive, you have to be made up of cells. Um, that cells themselves are the basic unit of living things, meaning that if you kind of break down living things to their simplest parts, you're gonna have a cell. Um, and that new cells come from pre-existing cells. Um, and so you kind of get this chicken and egg argument going, there had to be a first cell, but everything from that first cell on came from another cell that was in existence. Cells themselves come in tons of shapes and sizes, um, anywhere from 0.2 micrometers to close to a thousand micrometers. Um, typical cells are going to be 5 to 50 micrometers. Um, and to give you a better idea of what that kind of scale means, I'm going to have you pause me and go check out this website here, learngenetics.utah.edu. Um, if you just type in learn genetics and cells and scale, um, you can probably get there too. Um, and you're going to look at this interactive. Um, and so have fun with it. Check out all of the different things that they have there. Um, you can look at the size of different viruses, um, bacteria, organelles, um, and it'll just give you a better idea of what we mean by a micrometer or a thousand micrometers. Um, but make sure you answer these two questions in your notes. So I want to know how big exactly is an E. coli bacteria? So you're going to give me a measurement there. And then tell me which one is bigger, the influenza virus or hepatitis? So now we get to cells. When we talk about cells, we break them down into two main groups. You have prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes have no nucleus, um, and those are really your bacteria cells. And eukaryotes are your typical kind of plant and animal cells that you think of. They have a nucleus. Um, both types have cell membranes, DNA, cytoplasm, and ribosomes. Um, both carry out all the different things that life, living things do. They carry out all the life functions. Um, prokaryotes tend to be a lot smaller than eukaryotes. So here in this diagram you have an example of a white blood cell, which is a eukaryote, that's part of your immune system, attacking these bacteria which are prokaryotes. Um, and so you get an idea of the difference in size here. Um, prokaryotes, remember pro, no. Pro, no nucleus. That's really the main identifying factor. Prokaryotes are all bacteria. Um, and so here's another example of a bacteria. Um, this is the streptococcus bacteria. That's the one that gives you strep throat. Um, and all bacteria, prokaryotes, they have a pretty simple structure, but that doesn't mean that they're any less important or able to do less than we are. They actually are pretty efficient and can live in some pretty amazing environments. So 
just because they're simpler or don't have as much stuff inside doesn't mean that they can't do all of the things that eukaryotic cells can. Um, so here we go, eukaryotic cells. I always remember that you are eukaryotic. So your cells all have nuclei, or most of them anyway, have a nucleus, and that's where you store your DNA. Um, some single-celled organisms and all multicellular organisms are made up of eukaryotic cells. Um, and if you have a multicellular organism and you have lots of different cells working together, we find that those cells tend to specialize. So everybody has a specific job that they're really good at and they count on the other p cells in that organism to be really good at their jobs. So when we talk about cells, we talk about the way that they function kind of like a factory. Um, really it's just that they perform really specific tasks and the organelles are kind of like the workers of the factory. They perform specific repetitive tasks and are extremely good at them. Um, but you need all of them functioning properly and working together in order to have a viable cell. Um, organelles itself just means little organs. Um, and we're going to go through the different organelles and their basic functions and what they do in the cell. Um, so remember we're dealing with eukaryotic cells and so they will all have a nucleus. Um, the nucleus is going to be where you store your DNA and so DNA is just instructions for how to make a protein. It tells you what order to put the amino acids in. And so you want to make sure that you keep this DNA protected. It's your master copy, so you don't want to lose it or mess it up. And so you store it inside of this nucleus. Um, the nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. Um, it has these pores that can allow certain things in and out namely messenger RNA. Um, you don't just want to let anybody in there to mess with your DNA. Um, DNA itself gets organized into this kind of chromatin which is, oops, sorry about that, chromatin which is your DNA when it's in this open form that can be read. And chromatin is the DNA and it gets wrapped around these proteins to try to keep it organized. Um, you see it form these chromosomes only when the cell is about to divide and that's just when it gets really condensed and organized so that um, cells can divide and make sure they don't lose anything on the way. Ribosomes. So ribosomes are the next step in this whole protein synthesis um, model. Um, and they are these little tiny, they kind of look like dots when you look at them. Um, and they put together proteins. And so they will read the messenger RNA, which here you see this thing right here. This is representing some messenger RNA. Um, and here is the growing polypeptide or amino acid chain. And this guy right here, this green thing, that is your ribosome and it puts together the amino acids to form a protein. Next we have our endoplasmic reticulum. It can be found in a rough form or a smooth form. So you have your rough endoplasmic reticulum and your smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The rough ER um, is called rough because it has a bunch of ribosomes on its surface. You can see here in the picture, these are your ribosomes. Um, and so those ribosomes are putting together proteins and those proteins travel into the rough ER. Um, they get modified there um, and then they're going to be sent off to the next guy in our talk, the Golgi body. Um, the smooth ER is in charge of making new cell membranes. So that phospholipid bilayer comes from the smooth ER. It also is really important for detoxifying drugs in the body. Um, and so you'll find cells that deal with a lot of um, 
drugs or chemicals that they have to detoxify um, will have a lot of smooth ER. So here's the Golgi apparatus, also known as Golgi body. Um, it looks like a stack of membranes. You can see it here. And it has these little globules that are coming off of it, or vesicles. Um, they, you can think of this as like the UPS of the cell. Um, this is where proteins get packaged, shipped, um, labeled, and transported to the cell membrane where they can go out into the rest of the outside of the cell. Um, the Golgi apparatus also makes something called lysosomes, um, which we'll get to here in a second. Um, so here, you kind of see this whole protein synthesis in order, and we can kind of follow it. Sorry. Um, and so the DNA has the instruction. Those go out to your ribosomes where they get put together. So your protein is put together here. Um, it then gets modified in the rough ER and gets packaged and sent to your Golgi apparatus, which applies some finishing touches, um, labels it, and ships it outside of the cell. Um, your lysosomes. Remember we said the Golgi body was responsible for making lysosomes. Well, here they are. We call them kind of the garbage men of the cell. They break down um, stuff, old cells, old, I mean old organelles or cell parts that are no longer functioning. They can get broke down, broken down within the lysosomes. Um, you have vacuoles. Um, vacuoles are pretty easy to identify. You'll find a lot of them in plant cells, but they're also found in animal cells. Um, they tend to be used for storage of lots of different stuff like water or salts or proteins or carbohydrates. Um, they're really just compartments to store materials in. And so a lysosome is a specialized type of vacuole because it has digestive enzymes in it. Um, the mighty mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Um, basically, the mitochondria makes ATP. This is where cellular respiration, where glucose gets converted into ATP. Um, and the mitochondria are also inherited from your mother, so they're inherited maternally, and so you can actually check their DNA, and you'll see um, your maternal line. Chloroplasts, those are the green things in plant cells, and this is where photosynthesis happens. Um, you're only going to find them in plants or other photosynthesizing organisms. Um, and we call the pigment chlorophyll. So chloroplasts contain chlorophyll. Um, another interesting thing um, is something called the endosymbiotic theory. So we find that mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA, separate from our DNA, um, and they reproduce by themselves. And so we got, because of that, um, a biologist, Lynn Margulies, um, came up with this theory we call the endosymbiotic theory. Um, when we talk about origin of life, we'll talk about this in more detail, but because your mitochondria, oops, and chloroplasts contain their own DNA, the theory is that they used to be independent organisms and that they came into another bacteria type cell um, and they got along really well and now we have them all the time. Um, last but not least is the cytoskeleton and this provides structure and helps cells move. Um, so hopefully you've gotten all that. That was a lot of information. Um, feel free to go back, play this again, or go through the PowerPoint on the class website and ask questions when you get to class. Bye!